I want to I want to talk to to you about good news for God's people in troubling times. If you read the headlines very often, um, they're not real encouraging. Today is National Sanctity of Life Day. Um, we're not real good at that as a country, um, as a whole. Um, if you read the headlines, uh, even this morning, there was a mother that uh, killed her two children. Um, that was one of the headlines. Um, portions at an all-time high. You know, you just read it. It's, it can be discouraging. Um, but I'm here to declare good news for God's people. Uh, it is still a good day to be a Christian. Um, the Lord is faithful. He is always on time. He is consistent. He is always with us. It is a good day to be a Christian. It is a day filled with opportunities. The greatest days of the church are still ahead of us. Souls are going to be saved. Lives are going to be changed. We're going to be a blessing to people. It is a good day to be a Christian. Amen? Amen. So I want to give you some good news from God's Word. But let me read this to you. Acts 1, 1 through 5. It's written to Theophilus. The first book I wrote was about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. Before this, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I always like that, Jesus had the help of the Holy Spirit. With the help of the Holy Spirit, Jesus told the apostles he had chosen what they should do. After his death, he showed himself to them and proved in many ways that he was alive. The apostles saw Jesus during the 40 days after he was raised from the dead. And he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he told them not to leave Jerusalem. He said, wait here to receive the promise from the Father which I told you about. John baptized people with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you some good news headlines as a believer. These are truths for you and me if we're living for God in troubling times in the last days. These are truths that every one of us can apply to our life that are true for you and for me. The first thing I want to talk about that we see in this passage of Scripture is this. You've got to tilt your head. But God has a plan and you have a part. That is good news. In the days ahead, before He returns, God still has a plan. And you have a part. Has anybody ever tried cooking something you never made before and doing it without a recipe? Anybody ever done that? There are interesting times in our, in our kitchen at home because my daughters like to play like they're on Food Network. And so they will come, you'll come home and um, they will have been in the kitchen. There's powder, every, you know, flour everywhere. There's all kinds of stuff everywhere. I walked in a while back and they were making bread. Without a recipe. <laughs> and it, they had all kinds of stuff. They had it in the, the oven, the toaster. And um, it was unique. It was an interesting um, concoction. I don't know if it was Play-Doh or, or what. But, you know, you still have to eat it. If your daughter's making it, at least take a bite. Um, they needed a recipe. Now, the Holy Spirit, for you and I... I'm going to kind of use this example, and it's a stretch, okay? So give me some, some, some room, okay? But the Holy Spirit is kind of like the Betty Crocker cookbook, and He helps you and me know what it is that we should be doing in this life that we're living, okay? Um, verse 2 reads this way, and it says that Jesus, with the help of the Holy Spirit, so Jesus had the power of the Holy Spirit. He had the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, with the help of the Holy Spirit, Jesus told the apostles He had chosen what they should do. So, there was something that was chosen for the apostles to do in this difficult time that they found themselves in. Once the disciples met Jesus, their lives gained a divine purpose. The magnitude of what they were living for, their vision for living, the reason that those guys got up every morning wasn't just to catch fish. Their motivation was different than before they knew Jesus. Now a lot of people in our world 
Even sometimes some people who, who attend church. But a lot of people seem to kind of just stumble and drift through their life. They're kind of, they're kind of hoping that tomorrow will be better than today. They're hoping for a break. And many people end up spending their life with the main purpose of simply making a living or improving their lifestyle. They chose a profession based on what some test might have said they'd be good at or because someone in their family did it. They live where they live. They work where they work. They went to school where they went. They could live from paycheck to paycheck. All doing what they do because it was better than another alternative. But let me ask you this. What if it wasn't God's plan? What if it wasn't God's purpose for their life? You see, now I know this is insightful, but someday every one of us is going to die. Yes. Should the Lord tarry His coming, every one of us is going to die, and death is an uncomfortable topic. And most of us, when we die, did you know this? Most of us are going to take a while to do it. Do you know that? Most of us aren't going to die in, in a fiery crash or um, a sudden quick thing. But most people die slowly. Most people have some time to look back. Most people have some days, some hours to reflect on their life and ask questions like this. What did my life add up to? What difference did my life make? What did I live for? Who's going to remember me? What will they say when I'm gone? Why was it important that I even was born or I even existed? What, why was it even important? C.T. Studd has one of my favorite quotes. And he says, only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, t'will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. The Bible is clear that every one of us were handcrafted. We were divinely designed. We were given life for a unique purpose and a reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. I like how it reads out of the Message Bible. It says this. It says each person, every one of us, each person is given something. To do. You were given something to do. I was given something to do. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. You were giving some, given something by God to do. That if you do it, will reveal to the world who God is. Everyone gets on it, in on it, it says. Everyone benefits. You see, before you were born... God created and designed you for something supernatural. It was a purpose that is bigger than you could discover on your own. And you have to find out what that is. So let me ask you. What is your part in God's plan? In this big world, this big life that you're living, what, what part are you playing in God's plan? Why on earth are you even here? What has God handcrafted you to uniquely do for Him? Besides ministering to your family, that's for all of us. But besides ministering to your family, what is the number one most important thing that God wants to accomplish before He returns through you? What's He want to do in your life? You see, when you read the book of Acts, it's a whole bunch of ordinary people, ordinary individuals, and these ordinary people, they prayed with passion. These everyday ordinary people commanded demons to release their power over other people's lives. These ordinary people witnessed powerful miracles. They saw angels. These ordinary people, people just like you and me, they dreamed dreams. They had visions. They healed the sick. The entire church... Did you know, when you read Acts, the entire church, not just its leaders, but the entire church preached the good news and they were used to impact entire cities all at once. In these last days, I believe this with all my heart, it is going to be more important 
that each and every one of us discover and fulfill the divine purpose God has for us specifically. You see, the times we live in and the days that are coming, we're going to have to clearly hear, this is the way, walk in it. Do this. This is what I've chosen you to do. We must hear each of us from the Holy Spirit what is beyond His already revealed Word, what He has chosen for each of us to do. Each of us have a purpose and a plan. The miracles that we read about in Scripture should be taking place in our church, but He has equipped each of us to fulfill those things. Somebody here may have the gift of healing on their life. And God is just waiting for you to step out in faith and pray for someone. Someone may have the gift of prophecy because not one person has all these things. Someone may have the gift of encouragement. And if you're not functioning, the church lacks. And so you've got to find your gift, that special thing that God has called you to do in these last days that He wants to empower you to do, and He will do it. And so there is good news. God has a plan. No matter how bad it gets, God has a plan, and we have a part. We have a part. Second headline is this. You have a purpose. You have a purpose. Before I met Jennifer, she wasn't living there, but I moved to Ventura, California. And I had a condo. And I, in California, because of the price of land, typically they build up a lot more than they do here. Uh, but I had like a three-story condo, three or four-story. You parked way down low, just kept climbing. Um, and it was a long ways up and a long ways down. But here, my bedroom was on the top floor. And it was an ocean view. I had a round uh, window, and you could see the ocean. At least that's what it was built as. Uh, because if you got kind of like on the edge of your bed and looked out on your tiptoes, out over the orchard, you know, it's maybe a mile away or a little less, but you could see the, the ocean, the sunset, and uh, maybe an island, something like that. Um, but you could get a glimpse. And a lot of people, did you know that's all they've got is a glimpse of Jesus? Now you could see the ocean from my bedroom, but if that was the only glimpse, the only thing that you saw, you'd only have limited knowledge and understanding of something much bigger that was actually there. And to really understand and realize the awesomeness, the power, the magnitude, the beauty you need to have more revealed. It wasn't enough just to stand on my bed on the corner, but you need to have more revealed. And that's the way a lot of people are today. They know about Jesus. They've had a glimpse, but that's really about it. They've never truly experienced Him for themselves. And that's where you and I come in. You see, if you went about a mile west of my house, you could stand on the sand. Or you could walk out on the pier, the longest pier on the coast, the west coast. And you could feel the wind blowing off the water, the, the spray coming off the waves. You could watch the sunset over the Channel Islands off in the distance. You could smell the salt water. You could feel the ocean spray. You could hear the roar of the crashing of the waves on the rocks and the jetty. And the more of the ocean you could see and experience the more you could understand its beauty and you could appreciate its power and the more you were drawn to it. And that's kind of similar to a person's experience with Jesus. The better your life and my life reveals Him to the people around us, people see through us that Jesus is alive. Yes. Verse 3, the first part of that, it reads this way. It says, after his death, he, being Jesus, showed himself to them, and I like this, and he proved in many ways that he was alive. Did you know that's our purpose? We are proving to the world that Christ is alive and risen. Our cynical world that we live in needs desperately to see a tangible representation of Jesus before their very eyes. And they see Him through you and through me. 
That means my life, your life, is going to be lived differently than the people we interact with on a daily basis. If not, they don't see anything different. How we handle things like tragedy, disappointment, frustrations, even victories. How we treat those that we love as well as those that treat, mistreat us. How we treat people who take advantage of us. How we work. All plays a role in revealing Christ. How we speak, the words that come out of our mouth. The things that we find joy in. The things that make us laugh. And the things that cause us to cry. The things that make us angry with a righteous anger. The thing we do and why and how we do those things. As well as the things that we choose not to do in life. You see, this, those things prove to a cynical world that Jesus is still alive. He's making a difference in someone's life. There's a song, I always liked, it's an old song. I think the Imperial sang it. But it's, you're the only Jesus. Some will ever see. And the words go like this. It says, if not in you, I wonder where. Will they ever see the one who really cares? If not from you, how will they find? There's one who heals the broken heart and gives sight to the blind. And then the chorus goes like this. You're the only Jesus some will ever see. And you're the only words of life some will ever read. So let them see in you the one in whom is all they'll ever need because you're the only Jesus some will ever see. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, he said that you and I are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal to a lost world through you and me. You see, the fact is this. We are all leading somebody someplace. Every one of us in this room is leading somebody someplace. So, ask yourselves, is Christ being revealed through me? If so, how well? How, what kind of a glimpse, what kind of a picture am I giving the people I see every day of Jesus? What does my life, what does my values, what do my passions, my priorities... What do those things communicate to the people all around me on a daily basis? You see, we go back to 1 Corinthians 12, 7 out of the message. It says that each person, every one of us is given something to do. And when we do that thing, it reveals who God is. So my faithfulness will produce fruit. It will produce fruit. And as we do our part, we fulfill our purpose. Headline number three. Headline number three, good news for God's people in a troubling day. We've been given a passion. We're not just wandering aimlessly. We have something to live for. God has given us a passion. The story is told of a man who, while taking a walk down a country road, came across a stone quarry in which there were a number of men who were working in this quarry. This man who was taking the walk, he questioned several of these guys about what they were doing. The first man that he came to was quite agitated, and, and he was irritably, uh, he was upset. He irritably replied, can't you see? I'm breaking stone. That's what I'm doing. So the man went along, and he came to a second man. And the second man answered without even looking it up. He said, I'm earning $1,000 a week. But when the same question was asked to a third man, this third man stopped what, he's, what he was doing. He put his pick down. He stood up. And he looked the man in his eyes with obvious pride. And he said, if you want to know what I'm doing, I'm building a cathedral. And each man's response was a matter of how far they could see. It was a matter of what they were focused on. The first man couldn't see behind it, beyond his pick. The second man, he was focused on his paycheck. But the third man, he was looking beyond the tools. He was looking beyond the paycheck that he got. And he was focused on the ultimate end for which he was serving. You see, the third man was cooperating with the architect. However small his individual contribution may have been, however small it may have seemed, he was playing a part 
in constructing a building for the worship of God. His passion, his focus caused his work to turn into worship. And that can happen for anybody. Verse 3, the last part of verse 3 from Acts chapter 1 says this. It says that the apostles saw Jesus during the 40 days after he was raised from the dead. And he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. You know, when you're spending the last few moments with someone, if it's on your deathbed or it's the last time that you get to see them, you usually utter words that are very important. And Jesus spoke on those last times that he was with his disciples about what was most important to him. Jesus' focus, Jesus' passion was the kingdom of God. Luke 4 and verse 43, Jesus said these words. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. I must do it in other towns. I can't just stay here. I've got to go somewhere else. Why? Because this is why I was sent. I was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And he still speaks, even to this day, regarding the kingdom. My life verse has become Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things that concern you and you worry about and you want and you desire and you're so caught up with. All those other things will be added to you. But seek Him first. You see, that plays out in my life and in your life in how and why we work. In how and why... What we do with our earnings, our time, our, our, our health. It plays out in how we, we steward our lives. The closer that you and I walk with God, the more His kingdom will be our passion. Jennifer and I just had an anniversary. January 3rd. And we, uh, we were fortunate. We uh, don't always get to go somewhere, but we went up to Kansas City. I think when we arrived, it was 11 degrees or 8 or something like that. It was cold. Uh, but we were fortunate to go for a couple days up to Kansas City for our anniversary. And I have noticed something. Men, you may have noticed the same thing uh, with your spouse or vice versa. Um, I have noticed this, that she and I are completely different in something that we do when we stay in a hotel. Now, some of you are probably like Jennifer. Jennifer, when she gets into a hotel, she likes to get into the room and she likes to settle in. She will unpack her bags and she'll put them in the drawers in the hotel room. She takes it all out of the suitcase and she puts it into the closet, into the drawers, um, any, any space there might be. Okay? She organizes on the counter all her toiletries. And, uh, I mean, it, it kind of feels like home. Now, some of you are like me. It really doesn't matter how long I'm going to stay in that hotel. I'm not even going to bother to unpack. I am working out of the duffel bag. Okay? Uh, I just work out of the suitcase. And when I need something, I just pull it out. I don't even bother unpacking. And here's why. Because I know... I'm not going to be there very long. I know it's not going to be real long. Very soon, I'm going to have to pack it all up again and leave. Okay, now I'm not telling you that my way is the right way, even though it is. But I'm not telling you that my way is the right way. Okay? But when it comes to taking a trip, whether you unpack or work from your suitcase, that's up to you. Okay? But... When it comes to life, we all need to work from the suitcase, okay? When it comes to living, we all need to work from the suitcase. Hopefully, every one of us is here on earth at least 80 years. That would be great. But when you compare that, 96 years, young. When you compare 96 years with eternity, it is a blip. It's a dot if you're lucky. It's nothing compared to eternity. And so when it comes to, to living our life, we need to live as though we are just here on an overnight trip. If we spend our time, every one of us has the same amount of time on a daily basis. If we spend our time focused on this life 
And on this world, then we will come to the end of it having wasted our life. Because what matters is eternity. Sometimes it is easy. Has anybody discovered this? Sometimes it is easy to get up, get all caught up in trying to build a comfortable, successful life right here. And that becoming your passion, your focus. There's nothing wrong with some of those things, but it becomes a passion in your life. Sometimes we get so caught up with living here that we forget that this is not our home. We're just passing through. Some, this is a tent. And it's not going to be up very long. Sometimes we get so caught up with living here that we not only unpack the suitcase, we start redecorating the room. We paint the walls. We put a new carpet. Refin refinish the furniture. We hang a few pictures as though we're going to be there forever. Folks, life is short. You're just passing through. And while we're here, we must be resolved to not let our passion, our focus become this life, this world, our kingdom. Rather, our passion must be His passion. And Jesus' passion, the reason He came, was the kingdom of God. That must be our passion. Someone has said this. One has little care for that which they have little invested. One has little care for that which they have little invested. The early church that we read about in the New Testament was a powerful church. And in large part, they were powerful because they gave their all for the right passion. They sacrificed. They died to self so that they might live for Christ as His church. And when they did, God did great and miraculous things in the midst. So let me ask you, I mean, truly, what are you passionate about? What consumes your conversation? What is it that you're living for? Whose kingdom carries the most weight and leverage in your life? Is it His or is it yours? You see, the good news for any believer is that while there is a world out there and as the days get dark, they're searching, they're, there's confusion, God has given us something to be passionate about. It's the only thing that you'll sow yourself into, spend yourself on behalf of, that will truly fulfill. In a world that's filled with confusion, the Christian has a passion and a focus. And that is good news. That is good news. The fourth headline is this. And with this, we conclude. Good news. We've been given a promise and a power. Verse 4 and 5 reads this way. It says, once when he was eating with them, he told them not to leave Jerusalem. Okay, now at the end of the Gospels, he says, go. But here for a minute, he says, now hold up. Don't leave Jerusalem. He said, wait here. Anybody have problems waiting? Patience? Wait here to receive the promise from the Father, which I have told you about. John baptized people with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on. So we have a promise and we have power, and that's good news. A promise. That is good news because Jesus left His church with a spirit of expectancy. He didn't leave them discouraged. There was a hope. And a hope, here's what a hope does. When you have a promise, and when it comes from a, a worthy source, a hope, get, it motivates you. It motivates you to press on. It motivates you to stay faithful because God has said He would do this. Even when the circumstances are uncertain and the times are troubling, God has given me promises and I am motivated to press on. I, can't, I stay faithful. Some of those promises are these. 1 Samuel 12 and verse 22. The Lord will never abandon His people. Amen? It doesn't matter how dark it gets out there. It doesn't matter how discouraging it gets. It doesn't matter what school your kid goes to. The Lord will not abandon him or her or you. Yes. That's a promise from God. Hebrews 13, 5 reads this way. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. You see, we have promises that are given to us. 
And better yet, we have a promise of a supernatural empowerment and an enablement that is not our own, but that enables us to live in a troubled time with supernatural power and with answers that a world needs. You see, He's given us a power. Power is this. It's the ability to do. It's the ability to act or to accomplish. It is also authority. It's the right to control. It's the right to command or to determine. That's what the disciples did when they commanded demons out of, out of people. They had authority and they had power that wasn't their own. They spoke, come out of him now. And the demons left. Even to the point there was power on their lives when, when Peter would just be somewhere and his shadow would fall on someone and someone would be healed. Not, but a, not from a power of his own, but a power. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So, let's suppose, for instance, let's suppose I take some coal couple big nice chunks of coal. And let's say that I shove them into my Ford Flex out there into the gas tank. Coal is a source of power, amen? It's a source of power. But it's the wrong source of power for the purpose, for what needs to take place. If I'm going to be able to do my part and accomplish my purpose, I must have the correct power source in my life. I can't pull off the things that God wants me to do in my own power. I might have power, but it's the wrong power source. I must have the power that is supernatural and the power that comes from the Holy Spirit living and residing in me. Before the disciples could fulfill their divine purpose, they needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why God said, Jesus said, wait! Earlier he said go, but he said hold on, you don't have what you need yet. You need a power source that will enable you to do what I'm asking you to do. Jesus, Jesus is saying this, think about this. Jesus is saying and telling them to wait. They, he knew they were saved, their lives were right, but yet they weren't adequately empowered for the task that he was asking them to, to do. They were saved, but they needed something else. They needed a power, an empowerment. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. You see, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, those men, those women, those 120, and as the church grew, they would be unable to fulfill their divine purpose. They could try. They could do everything in their power. They could do advertising. They could do whatever. But they wouldn't succeed. They needed something else that would enable them to do what to that point would have been considered impossible. I want to show you a picture. This is one of my favorite athletes. I'll see if anybody knows who he is. Anybody know who that is? He's a good looking guy, isn't he? Man, you might have noticed that. Strong, athletic. That is Laird Hamilton. Laird Hamilton is he's kind of always been one of my favorite. He is a surfer. He is the one who created, he's the big wave surfer. Um, that kind of started it all. He invented um, kite surfing. He invite, invented where they tow you in on a, on a uh, jet ski for the big waves in Hawaii. He's the first one to do all that. And here's one of the waves he's on. That's a pretty gnarly wave. That's big, isn't it? Um, he almost died a couple years ago on a wave that was over 100 foot high. Um, you got to be halfway crazy to get out there on it, I think. Um, but what happened is... Laird Hamilton has a dream to surf the unsurfable wave. There are waves that are so big that technology and uh, what man has done so far does not enable him or others to surf them because the wave moves so fast that the surfboards to this at this point cannot keep moving and they'll be overcome and they, they'll die in those waves. Well, Laird Hamilton has invented something. I don't ever want to try it, but it's cool. He's He's invented a foil surfboard, a hydrofoil. And now, in the last few years, this guy, Laird Hamilton, is surfing waves that up to this point in all of history were considered impossible. It would never happen. How's he doing it? He needed something beyond himself that would enable him to do the impossible, to accomplish the impossible task. 
Now let me just use that as an example, okay? The Holy Spirit empowers and He enables you and me to accomplish something that we are not capable to do without Him. Just like that foil board does. We must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, I believe this. There is a wave of persecution and difficulty coming. I believe that. I also believe that, that there's also a wave of opportunities in those times as well. But in the days ahead, you're going to have a difficult time if you're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. There is a world of people that are going to come up against some times that are bigger than they are. That everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And they're going to lean on everything, what they've tried to lean on in the past, finances, security, all these different things, and it's not going to be there. And you are going to need, like never before, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And He is adequate, more than adequate, to enable us to do what He wants us to do in the days ahead. You see, that's good news. That's good news. I want to read you one quote and we're going to pray. J.B. Phillips. Um, some of you have heard the Phillips translation um, of Scripture. But he also wrote a book and it's called The Young Church in Action. It's about the, the, the early church, the book of Acts. I'm going to read you a quote. Because this is, man, I think this is what we dream of being and seeing happen. He says, surely, speaking of the church in Acts, surely this is the church as it was meant to be. It is vigorous and flexible. For these are the days before it ever became fat and short of breath through prosperity or muscle bound by over organization. These men did not make acts of faith. They believed. They did not say their prayers. They prayed. They did not hold conferences on psychosomatic medicine. They simply healed the sick. By modern standards, they may have been naive. But perhaps because of their simplicity, perhaps because of their readiness simply to believe, to obey, to give, to suffer, and if necessary, to die, the Spirit of God found that He could work in them and through them, and so they turned the world upside down. God can still do that again. I'm more excited about the future than ever. That is good news for God's people. I don't walk into any situation powerless or unequipped. There is a supernatural power. I have a purpose. I have a passion. God has a plan. And I get to play a part in what He is going to do in these last days that is going to boggle our minds. It's going to, it's going to be unbelievable. And that is good news. Good news for everyone.